It's Tuesday, November 4th, 2014. I'm Jimmy Prince Effect. And I'm Trey Comstock, putting your final orders because this is Tech's Last Call, episode 94. Your last call for tech news of the week. Tonight, Jimmy buys a turbo with current C, and I celebrate Microsoft's coming out party. <laughs> but, uh, we. Oh, God. We start. What? You know? <laughs> it's, it's not often I get to use those jokes. Um, in not a wildly insensitive way. So, um, we start tonight with Microsoft showing itself off as a modern tech company. And by modern tech company, I mean a company that is now producing a wearable. But unlike the Apple Watch that is months away, and unlike the Samsung Galaxy... Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Kind of which and are, none of them are compatible with each other. None of them are compatible with each other, which are awful. And unlike the Moto, Expen- Moto 360, which, although good, is very expensive, Microsoft has, has announced and launched the Band, or specifically the Microsoft Band. So you have the Apple Apple Watch and the Microsoft Microsoft Band. Now, the Microsoft Band, $200, integrates a metric butt ton of sensors including the one that i think is always most important a heart rate monitor that is running constantly unlike the stuff on the galaxy products um it integrates sleep tracking it integrates a standalone gps so you can map your runs without a phone you can track your steps without a phone and you can measure your heart rate without a phone. This has enough standalone functionality to do all your workout stuff, and you never have to have your phone. If you do have your phone with you, it also integrates all the smart watch goodness. So notifications, email, calendar, Cortana, so you can talk into your band, and it does stuff. Its design's interesting. So rather than having a screen on top and a clasp on bottom, it's designed the way I used to wear my wearable, with the screen on bottom and the clasp on top. Again, this is kind of to make it a little more subtle. The screen's real small. Um, I... It, it looks it looks like it's a fairly thin, very much like a, a Fitbit Flex, just the same thickness yeah. all the way around instead of the way the Fitbit was kind of thicker on one spot and then gets thinner for the rest of the band. So it's a 1.4 inch screen, uh, 320 by 106 no, pixels. Yeah, say, 3.4 or 1.4, like very long. Right. So, I mean, retina screen, this is not... But do you need that on your wrist? No, but so it'll do the email, call, text, social, Cortana stuff. Here's the kicker. Here's the real kicker, right? So it's got all the features you really want in a smartwatch, right? Whereas the Apple Watch only works with iPhone, whereas the Samsung stuff really only works with Samsung, Samsung devices. Samsung phones. And the Moto 360, although good and works on all Android devices, it still is Android devices. This is cross-platform cross-platform apple windows phone android in that way it is more cross-platform than the pebble it is right. more full-featured than the pebble and still offers between 24 and 48 hours of battery life under normal use yeah the 24 is with the gps right, right. and then the 48 is without but was still this has and correct me if i'm wrong um i may be cross wiring this story with the fitbit story from this week but the it has constant yeah it's heart constant. rate monitoring it's 24 hour heart is, rate monitoring which heart is something that not all of the current and that, and that's an important distinction because not all of the current right. health monitoring devices actually have constant uh, right. heart it's rate just monitoring. every once in a while which you know, when you're sitting still, okay, that's interesting. Or if you're using it for sleep tracking, you don't necessarily need constant. You just need enough of a sample so that you can get what your resting heart rate. Because all like sleep monitoring is with your heart rate is looking like, what's your resting heart rate? How long are you staying at that resting heart rate? Blah, blah, blah. Um, So, but for a workout, you want continuous tracking. Right. You you want to know know as you're climbing and when you're going to hit that peak. Right. So I think that this is a... um, 
this is definitely a sexy device as far as the specs, what it can do, what they're offering, and the cross-platform ability. I mean, you know, so I have a Pebble Steel, and mm -hmm. the Pebble Steel is now the same price as this device. And um, They're it, both $200, and I would argue that they both have kind of the same... Ha both have a chance in this market sure. because they're cross-platform, they're $200, so they're on the low end of the smart watch category and they do different things so this is very much targeted at the health tracking with the smart like watch notification stuff as well what i like about the pebble is i can wear it in professional context and i've been called out two or three times is that a digital watch right. or an analog watch? so this is professional if you're a certain kind of professional right so i wore the um the Polar Loop, which actually this looks a lot like the Polar Loop, um, but with a obviously much more advanced screen. I wore that in a professional context. It, well, and people wear Fitbit Flexes right. in a professional context. But it's not necessarily a professional looking thing. I think where the Pebble Steel, the Moto 360, and the Apple Watch have this actual like, we have designed this thing to look good. Microsoft has designed this thing to look unobtrusive. Now, I haven't seen it in person, so I don't know how really chunky it is, but by putting the screen on the underside of the wrist and just having a very simple, clean-looking clasp on the top of the wrist, um, this is going with uh, it recedes into the background. Maybe it just looks like you're wearing one of those, you know, rubber bracelet, rubber support a thing bracelets or whatever. Like, right, this which is, is where these things all kind of grew out of. Right, and so this is try trying to recede into the background, unlike the pebble steel apple watch moto 360 we're like bam this is a heavily industrial designed device to look like something you want to show off the other thing that with the heart rate monitoring that is going into these devices it's making it so that one of the problems that i always had with fitbit flex when i had it was that it said you had to wear it on your left wrist because the idea is you know as i'm gesturing here this is my right wrist this is not the wrist i wear my watch on this is also not the wrist I should wear a Fitbit tracker on because it's the one I move the most. Sure. So in order to get an accurate kind of step count, it wants it on your less dominant hand. Sure. However, that's also where I wear my watch. So I don't want to wear a watch and a Fitbit. That's right. just stupid. Right. And so this, it get, with that heart rate monitoring, it's less reliant on the step tracking in terms of actually tracking fitness. It also mm. integrates with the Microsoft Health platform, um, which is which is basically their response to HealthKit it's or to uh, Google, Google Fit. Fit. Um, what's interesting about HealthKit is that, it, or he excuse me, Microsoft Health, is that it integrates with Microsoft's kind of big data stuff. Um, so it integrates... Which are basically Azure. <laughs> basically Azure. They call it the intelligence engine. Um, and so it starts calculating calories burned when you exercise, and then it can start giving you recommendations, like how long should you recover, how long you should recover, um, which sleep is more restful. And the hope is eventually to integrate all of this together, pulling in stuff like your email and your calendar through Office 365. Again, it's all Azure. Right, um, and Outlook. So it figures out like the meetings that you're going to have versus the quality of sleep or how much exercise you're going to need, and it starts to kind of give you recommendations, crunching your health information, your outlook information, your calendar information, putting that all together into actual useful information. Now, that's and not all together yet, but that's their hope given that, you know, it's interesting that two the two of these com two of the three companies really involved in the space Apple, Microsoft and Google, two of them are big data companies. And Microsoft is making a very deliberate big data play here. Well, and I think that that's the way Microsoft is approaching most things. So when I sat through and we we talked about this a little bit on uh, T4 last week that when I sat through my my whole company talking about, oh yeah, we've got this new website, we're using SharePoint. Uh, they didn't actually talk about the fact that they're using SharePoint, but they kept talking about it's like Google. It's big data. It's you know, use. It's like using Facebook. It's like this. You know, making it clear to everyone that this is all the stuff in your life that this is like, and it does it exactly the same way 
except for your corporate life instead of for which is obviously the pitch that they got from Microsoft. Right. That is how Microsoft has pitched this device this product to them. Well, and it's so Microsoft's- it really makes it obvious how their mobile first yeah. cloud first approach is actually being implemented. When you look at this band. This is the sits band at the is heart of mo- this is this sits at the heart of mobile first cloud first if you really think about it. So this is running clearly Windows embedded, right? I mean this is which is also going to become part of the Windows 10 platform. So well, everything it, from your band to your pixel perfect display all running one operating system. And it's leveraging the backdrop of Azure and mm-hmm. their cloud infrastructure in order to provide information to you that is actionable that is useful well, you know in what a way about, that Google, Google gets all this data and they're still trying to figure out how to use it. Right. And you want to know this is really leveraging? So everyone talks about how Bing is a boondoggle, right? That, you know, online, that Bing never it's makes not, money. Though. It's not. It is as a search engine. But as a data intelligence play, this is essentially being powered. The, the hope is that Microsoft Health is essentially being powered by Bing tools by Bing as a software architecture that has developed and is now integrated into everything else. Bing is the big data number crunching part of this. And and I'm going to say it, that the reason why Bing is more of a flop than maybe it should be is just because Google has the mind share. Sure. Google is synonymous with search the way that Kleenex is, is synonymous with facial tissue. And like, Xerox is with copying. Right, even though we have a Canon copier in my office now. We used to have right. a Xerox. But the Kyocera. <laughs> <laughs> it shows how many copies I make. Yeah. But, but basically, the I think that it's that Bing is still a great search. I've used Bing recently, and it provides different data than Google. Um, it presents it in a different way than Google. I mean, of course, at some point, you have just a list of links and whatever. With but it provides it in a different way than Google, whereas Google's leveraging their Google Now platform and making everything kind of look that way, including when you search for a business, it shows you kind of what would be the card in Google Now for that business, including the location and things like that. Bing will show you images from, I think, Yelp is who they're... Yeah, I believe so. They're, I th- but Bing partners, whereas Google scrapes. Well, what... Also, what I think is interesting, if you thinking about the platform discussion that I think is what we've been having all year, is this platform discussion. Mm-hmm. Microsoft is starting to look like what Apple should be. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. Microsoft now has the tight integration between the hardware they make and the software they make taken out to the level of big data. Whereas Apple stops at online services and does not have a big data play which is all Google is. Google looks like what Microsoft used to be, right? A big data company that sort of basically farms out the devices. Microsoft's brought so much of the devices in-house that the the top-of-the-line stuff in every category except gaming PCs, basically, is Microsoft in-house stuff. Well, and all the the top-of-the-line gaming PCs are all boutique. And all all boutique in some way. Um, Or homemade. But so they're making their own wearable. They're making their own smartphones. They make their own tablets. They make their own gaming system. And so they're able to, and they're actually tightly integrating, especially with Windows 10. They're going to be, they are and continue to be tightly integrating that, not just with their online services. It's not just that I can put in my Microsoft ID and my OneDrive stuff shows up. It's that all of these services are also integrated into the larger Microsoft cloud. That this argument for one Microsoft is actually kind of working, at least on me. And it's what Apple, where Apple has fallen short of, is it's not that they, they do have tight integration between their online services and their devices, but it doesn't go as far as the big data of Google and Microsoft. Right. And so and Microsoft data, now, yeah. And the big data of those two companies is what I find interesting about both of those companies. It's also arguably the future. It is actually right. the future. I mean, at this because, point, Apple feels like it's just making a better Palm Pilot. Because so all I had to do was log into my Google account on this thing, and it downloaded all of my my settings and all my I mean, apps. Apple has that. And all of that stuff. But it also has all my Google Now right. and those things as well. So it, it's 
it's that next step of integration. The second that I logged in, it was still downloading all of my apps. But when I swiped to the Google Now, this is the Nexus 9, by the way. Um, when I swiped to my Google Now, it had all of my Google Now that was showing on my phone. Right. And including what- the... Um, the Heat Rockets game that was going on tonight uh, that I was actually interested in. What makes Siri fall short for me, anyways, is its almost complete lack of predictive. Now, it you know, it's fine at, like, text-to-speech and reading my text messages, and it's at least figured out, like, where I live, both the places I live, and one of the places where I work. Great. Good job there. But it doesn't have that, like, you know, predictive stuff or, like, warnings about flights, even though it gets all of my email, right? So Siri has more access to more of my life than Microsoft or Google, and seems to, and it is unable to surface relevant things. And some of that is because of the lack of big data. That it's the big data that lets Google read your email, not just read your email for ads, but figure out, hey, you've got a flight, and then give you a flight notification. Right, and mine it'll tell me this is the gate you're flying out of, your flight is on time, or it's delayed, and it'll give me that the morning of my flight, or it usually gives it to me about 12 hours before my flight, so if I have a morning flight, it'll give it to me the night before. And Cortana will do that too. Siri, I mean, Apple has the perfect opportunity. Siri got out there first too. Siri got out there first, but Siri isn't, Siri is just not a toy, but really just an assistant. She's not an integrated across things really because though here's what should happen because apple has all the pieces for this and just doesn't have the big data muscle to make it happen so siri gets an email from siri reads my icloud email from delta with a flight notification what siri should be able to do is then use the delta app that's on my phone to check me in with delta then have the pet the Tickets show up in Passbook, and notifications show up in stream with the rest of my notifications on the operating right. system that about would the be status awesome. of the flight. That would well, be awesome, and all of the pieces are there except for that key piece of big data. Of the background to do it. Now, the one thing that I would change about your theoretical situation is I would want Siri or Google Now or Cortana, whatever we're using for this, to pop up and ask me, this or say basically this is your current like this is your seat number yeah. you know would you like to check in for your flight and i click yes yeah well, sure 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 yeah 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 so yeah. so that maybe that's not happening in the background fine or i have to scan my thumbprint to track in for the flight like check in for the flight right. like i'm fine with that um because then i would go in and say yeah, actually i really wanted economy plus i actually want to be able to um stretch right. out well, i want to be given that choice right before to to check in right but, right, but but that kind of integration that the other two forget. platforms do. And like HealthKit, I actually use it because it tracks my steps and then dumps that straight into Weight Watchers. That's interesting. Well, did I tell you that I, I got my Fitbit to integrate integrate with Weight Watchers? Did I tell you about that? Yes. Yeah. yeah I mean, because I then, mean, now they have got, to set it up. But. Right. And part of that is because Weight Watchers now has an API where it can accept steps and convert that into points. And that's useful for me. But... I'm not get you know it doesn't have the richness of data that Microsoft's going to have from the fit, from the band and it doesn't seem to have the ambitions of they themselves providing any sort of number crunching about your life. It's just a way to track things. What Microsoft and Google are doing is not just track but predict. And that predictive step is the future. Now that predictive step is also kind of scary because at what point does it start to take away your autonomy but that's a much bigger that's a much bigger question about where this is all going where we are right now is a place i very much want to be unlike where microsoft unlike where walmart seems to want to be taking us so what on earth is current c not currency i know what that is that's money what is current c current c is a third Okay, it's a competitor for Apple Pay, for lack of a better term. Yeah. It's been around significantly longer and is kind of championed by Walmart. And the idea behind it is that you have a QR code that you scan and using an app, and it cuts out Visa, MasterCard. Right, it, so it's a direct – so currency and their network of partners, what is it called, MCX? 
Yeah, it's MCX. Right. So MCX has a direct relationship with your merchant. bank. So it produces a QR code. You scan the QR code, and then that takes money directly out of your bank account. It actually and works it, the way the Starbucks app currently works. Right. It basically works like the Starbucks app, where instead of scanning just for Starbucks, though, right. it also takes into account loyalty right. stuff. Which is what know. all the retailers really want. They want it so that you have your loyalty card and everything else in one barcode, and you scan it, and they get all of that information all in one go. Right. But, and this has been around for years, and it's it's supposed to actually have an app released early in 2015. Right. And there's been a, there's been a lot of issues with currency this week as Apple Pay got activated, and some retailers, including CVS, CVS and, and Rite, Rite Aid, Aid. Um, they stopped supporting Apple Pay. They had not Actually, really not even further than that. They just turned off NFC. Full stop. Yeah. Okay, so they had not officially supported Apple Pay. But anything that uh, runs NFC will run Apple Pay. Yeah, and they as, have the NFC terminals. As I keep you... I, there's a vending machine on campus that's NFC enabled, so I just... I've bought a lot of stuff at the vending machine because I just go tap my phone, and then out comes M&Ms. Yeah, okay, so I saw a vending machine this weekend. I was at an outlet mall, and they had an NFC vending machine. I was like, this would be a perfect opportunity to use Google Wallet without looking like an idiot. Uh, but I was like, no, 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 no. The stuff in that vending machine is far too expensive for me to be spending uh, my Google Wallet money on. But I, I was tempted to try it out. But anyways, so current currency is is a direct competitor to Apple Pay, and... It's not necessarily as uh, the whole argument behind currency is that they're leveraging the cloud in order to be able to do this. They're not right. storing anything locally on your device. It's all stored in a secure cloud location. However, because those have never been hacked. So, however, the news from this week, the actual big news from this week, is that emails of people that had signed up for currency or had been signed up to be notified about currency were hacked. Right. And people got those emails. Just, now, granted, just emails. It's just emails. It is the lowest level of hacking that anyone can do where they get the emails. They didn't get passwords or they didn't credit get cards any bank information. bank information. They got nothing else. They only got emails. At least that's what we're getting right now. But okay, but, so here, here's the, th- the other question, thing. Of, go ahead. Yeah, I would say the, the question is can we really trust them then? Well,. So they're trying to act like the 800-pound gorilla in the room. So theoretically, you... It is Walmart. Well, it, it's Walmart, which is the largest retailer in the world. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's interesting. So what MSC, what M- MCX and Current C set up is that if you are a Current C user, you, can, you have to exclusively use Current C as your non-credit card payments. That is to say, you cannot accept NFC payments if you are a current C member or else you face high fines from current C. Now, the argument from MCX is that, oh, well, we're not, it's not technically an exclusivity because, like, we don't make people use MC, current C. But if you use currency, you can only use currency. Yeah, this is what it says on their uh, answers to your questions blog. They yeah. say that um, MCX merchants make their own decisions about what solutions they want to bring to their customers. The choice is theirs. So basically, no, if they're part of our network, they don't necessarily have to do this. However, when merchants choose to work with MCX, they choose to do so exclusively. And we're proud of the long list of merchants who have partnered with us. Importantly, if a merchant decides to stop working with us, there are no fines. Right. But if you there are fed, there are fines if you try to use both, and in some ways, current C is what the retailers want, not what the customers want. So the retailers still want to maintain that direct relationship with you, rather than going through a third party, which is a credit right. card company or Apple Pay, which is the credit card companies. Um, and they want to be able to integrate in the loyalty card stuff again to maintain that direct relationship with their consumers, which Apple Pay doesn't let them do. Because Apple Pay is super locked down and actually, in a way, super secure because they don't even get your actual credit card number. They get a credit card token and that's it. So in some ways, Apple Pay is locked down to the point where the retailers are unhappy. Now, boo friggin who, I don't necessarily care. This This smells to me like the record companies that were putting out 
MP3 S specialized MP3 SD cards that would only work on a special MP3 SD card reader because they didn't want to deal with iTunes. Now, right. Apple has kind of come out and said, hey, look, if you want to keep your consumers happy, let them use Apple Pay. And I agree. Apple Pay, real seamless, right? I go... Well, I hold... and the other thing is that accepting Apple Pay does not exclude, like, Google Wallet, right. for example, it, or any other NFC payment system. It's so unApple like It's funny. It's secure, unlike so many Apple things. It is essentially... It is essentially generous in that it's not exclusive, right? You can accept Apple Pay and... Every RFID credit card and Google Pay. And yeah, you can put a little Apple Pay logo there or whatever, but that doesn't mean Google Pay isn't going to work. It's just going to be fine. Or Google Wallet. Whatever the hell that these Google things Wallet. are called. Whatever these things are called. It's t- words. Google Wallet has been around for a long time. Right. But but Apple has the muscle to make it prominent. But they've said, look, we have this standard, and it's a really good standard. But who cares? What we really want is just to get well, you know, contactless payments out there. And I think that the other problem is that this is all a fight on the back end. Like con- consumers, we don't care about whether it's currency or Apple Pay or Google Wallet or my traditional credit card that I've used forever because all of these problems are all merchant problems. All right. of these problems are the merchants don't want to have to pay credit card companies. They're 2 to 3%. Or sure. whatever it is that Square like that that's the whole idea behind Square. That's how Square makes money. Well, that's how any of these things make money. That's how they a payment process, processor makes money. They that's all how there's process money in the it. payment and the retailer pays. So by the way, if you're use, if you're shopping at a local store and you don't want them to pay the fee, use a debit card. Right. That's um, actually why retailers like debit cards and gas stations like debit cards. Because it is because again, that's the direct relationship with your bank account. And that's different. And so if you really want to give retailers a break, don't use Amex because it has the highest processing fees. However, if you don't like the retailer, then always use Amex. Right. So, for instance, I always use my Amex at Walmart so I can soak them that little extra bit. That's right. You just stick it to them so that their margin just becomes that much less. Right. Well, if, you look, use it on tun- Amazon all the In time. Tunnel Hill, Georgia, Walmart's about what we got, okay? <laughs> um, it's, you know, in, in Atlanta, I don't ever go to Walmart. And, you know, I find myself a fair amount out in the country. Anyways, MSC or MCX or current C really starts to cloud this issue, though. So we have all of these companies that are essentially working together, the credit card companies, Google, Apple. They're essentially all doing the same thing, and it's interesting. Um, and then you have MCX saying, we're going to use an entirely different technological metaphor that's way kludgy, right? So you're going to have a barcode. QR code that shows up on your phone and we're going to scan also, the image. Also, QR the... codes are like the least secure thing in the world. Right. Because all I have to do is take a picture is... of that QR code. Oh, no. All I have to do is, is put a sticker on the QR code when I'm checking out and then you're hacked. Right. Hacking a QR code is like the easiest thing in the world. Right. So, so I... And it, it, it's just going to make it confusing for consumers. Oh, do you take? Oh, you take currency. I need it. I need this app that's not built into the phone. I need what? How do I set that? I need Screw to set it. my just, bank no, no, account. No, no. Here's far, my credit too card. Far. Here's my credit card. Right. Whereas Apple Say currency. I don't have that app. Here's my credit card. Or what? What is that? How does that work? And Apple, it's just take a picture of your credit card and it. Show basically, there's a verification process, but you do that once. It's baked into the operating system. Same with Google Wallet, and so it becomes pretty easy. It's based on a technology that is already in use by the credit card companies. It's just bringing it into digital devices, and again, right. it's functional, <laughs> and it's out now. And currency is a tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow problem. And right. some of the arguments I've heard is like, oh, it's not really aimed at like places where apple owners shop look apple is like the number two smartphone seller in the world you can't really make the class argument of like well rich people don't go to walmart you've well, not lived in rural america well yeah that's true but there's also the argument of you ever since the iphone 4 was the free phone people have been getting of, of all right. socioeconomic statuses have been getting iphones right and so eventually Apple Pay will trickle trickle down to 
the whole. It will take three generations yeah. of of iPhones, but that's three years. So you're saying three years from now, every single person with an iPhone and every person with an Android phone and will have an have NFC. An phone, yeah. Well, basically everyone. Most Android phones these days have NFC in them. My, uh, so I'm, I will so, be willing to bet that in three years that will be a standard feature. So I'll tell a funny story and then we'll move on to the to the to the next thing. But uh, so my. Lumia 1020 also has NFC. So if I hover my iPhone, ne- touch the I- the back of my iPhone to the back of my Lumia 1020, the Apple Pay stuff comes up. It shows my credit card and a fingerprint because it thinks for some reason it's a credit card terminal. Okay, here, here's my other f- fun one. This has NFC. Oh, that's so dumb. I can walk up to this. Well, that's because Android uses NFC for different things. So remember that whole thing about the iPad Air 2 not having NFC so you don't look like an idiot? I'm really tempted to try this yeah, at, uh, work. at like a Walmart or something. It works. So speaking of phones that are trying something, there's a new Droid. Yes. Our newest installment in the Droid series has come, and it's actually the phone that I wanted the Nexus 6 to be. Uh-huh. So it the is Droid Turbo exactly. is the name Turbo. of the new phone. Droid. So it has uh, a forced induction. So, but it's pe- off on the off the exhaust system and not off the front. Yes, of the actually, engine. it's it's a it's a twin twin it's turbo twin scroll um, turbo. So yeah. one for kind of low revs the, the low, and one for and high the, revs. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah, really you got it. maintains a lack of turbo lag, like the current generation of uh, BMW V6s, or yes. like EcoBoost uh, with Ford. Yes, yes, like the uh, Fusion. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So the Droid Turbo, you might say, is like is like a Ford Fusion. <laughs> Yep. Great. Next. <laughs> okay. Um, the dro- <laughs> Okay, so the Droid Turbo is the next generation of the Droid HD Max or whatever they're calling it. the last Droid Max, I think was yeah. the last version. Razor Max. It used to be just um, used to be No, Razor it was the Max. Razor Max first and now I think it was the last one was the Droid Max, which still remains available. And then this is the Droid um, Turbo. Turbo. Now, part of that is it has gets the turbo charging that the Moto X and the uh, Nexus 6 both have, which in those two phones charges them in six minutes or uh, to six hours of battery life in 15 minutes. In this phone, it charges it to, with eight hours of battery life in 15 minutes. Wow. So, it, um, and that I think has to do with the actual wall wart that this thing comes with. Um, it pushes so much amperage into the phone that it'll charge it up that quickly Hmm. um which is a super handy feature um and helps to make up for the fact that you don't have replaceable batteries anymore Um, that's that's really nice so the other thing you get you get a 2.7 gigahertz snapdragon processor uh you get a 3900 milliamp hour battery which is the killer feature of this which makes it so it has a 48 hour battery claimed, life claimed claimed so that's manufacturer claimed it functionally is probably more in the 36 to 40 hour still. but still claimed of 48 hours we have so many people claiming all day battery life this is claiming literally like two the microsoft days. band like the microsoft band yeah, yeah this is claiming literally two days of battery life um and then it's a carrier exclusive for Verizon. Uh, it comes in a nylon glass back as well as the the ballistic Kevlar, back, which is Kevlar. They, which is Kevlar. Um, the the nylon glass is, uh, comes in thirty two and sixty four gig sizes, whereas the Kevlar only comes in a thirty two gig size. Sure. Um, and it is available now. It was uh, it came out on the thirty first. It was announced on the 29th, Came out on the thirty first. It's available now. Yeah, Microsoft Band also available now, although totally uh, sold out. Yeah, because it's awesome. Because it's awesome. But so what's uh, the catch it, here, Jimmy? It's on Verizon. It's on Verizon. That's the catch. Is an unlocked version available? Uh, no, there's no. not an unlocked version available. However, there are rumblings. I saw today that there may be a Droid. Um, what, what was it? Max Turbo? Or no, it's it's not even Droid. It'll just be a. Uh, or no, Moto Max is right. the what I heard, and that's for international markets, and will most likely be unlocked. So you can probably buy a, a Moto Max, Moto Max in Mexico or from Mexico, de Mexico, Movistar, de Movistar, sí, claro, <laughs> Telefónica, um, and then use it on U.S. carriers if you'd like, uh, which is something that I would be interested in. It, it retails for two hundred dollars on contract. Um, so it's a phone. Sorry, it's a modern smartphone. It is six hundred dollars uh, off oh, contract. Sure. 
but which is Verizon's, how you'd have to get it from movie star <laughs> but verizon is also incentivizing um that anyone that's upgrading that any of their current customers that are upgrading to the droid turbo will have their upgrade fees waived um wow. so this is very much and i read that there's an article um from uh, Roger Chang over at CNET that was very interesting, which is how in this age of no carrier exclusives that are actually like successful, like for example, the HTC first was near a carrier exclusive. Uh, yeah. It was a total flop. Uh, yeah, but, but like, you know, back in the day, like iPhone was the AT&T exclusive. Like it was a killer exclusive. Because it- and that was the exclusive that forged the Android Verizon Motorola well, and, like the, and, Trinity. The, and and for a while, Droid was a meaningful thing for Verizon because the first Droid was the first Android phone worth buying. Oh yeah, and because the all T-Mobile the... G1 not worth buying no, was garbage. Buy. No, the the HTC uh, Nexus Nexus Prime Prime Nexus One. I don't remember Nexus One. I don't remember. It was amazing. But that, I mean, that predates these th- those two phones, the G1 and the Droid. And the Motorola uh, Droid, the original Pre- Droid. With the original the, the Droid. The slide-out keyboard right. running Froyo. Um, yeah. I mean, it, like, that was the phone that kind of put Android on the map. And it wasn't, yeah. you know, it Android has blown up since there, but it took, you know, that was, what, 2010? It was 2009 um, that that was that was all done, and the reason why I know that is I read the article. Um, but Verizon also has a hundred million dollars that they paid LucasArts right, for use for the, use the term Droid. It's in the small the, print if you read it on the ads. Yeah, it says license from LucasArts LucasArts. because and and that means there's gonna they're gonna have a great advertising campaign for this phone. This is a killer phone. Yeah. Anyone on Verizon looking for an Android phone should bypass the Moto X and buy this phone. Sure, because this is it like has a, a Moto better, X. has a 21 megapixel camera as opposed to the Moto X's 13 megapixel right. camera. Stati- like, based on all of the stats, it's the this phone... the same kind of motherboard and processor kind of and stuff. And also, the other thing I just remember... Okay, so it has a 2560 by 1440 display on a 5.2-inch... Quad HD? That has a dumb yeah. name. Quad HD? HD? It's yeah. the same thing that's the, the iPad Air two is okay and the nexus nine okay so it has something like 526 Jeez. pixels per inch Jeez. it is preposterous yeah at 5.2 inches so it's this phone, phone is right in the size range where it's reasonable that's that's a great phone that it it's legitimately is a great it phone. Is, i will argue at the end of the year when we're talking about device of the year that this is the best android phone out there sure. and the only reason that it will not be able to win out most likely is even the best phone out there is because of the new iphones right the the new iphones and because specifically it's- the iphone 6 plus even though i think that technically this phone this phone addresses a consumer need in a way that the iPhone 6 Plus does not. The iPhone 6 Plus addresses the consumer need of a larger iPhone. <laughs> I, no, it, it, it addresses a number of consumer needs. One of them is, yes, a larger iPhone. One of them is also an iPhone with better battery life, which is, to a certain extent, the same what question the, that this it, addresses. Right? Because I did an experiment. I can now go – I could not make it through a day towards the end of my life of, of my iPhone 5. I go consistently two days on my iPhone 6 Plus without right. and charging. That, and that's one of the problems I'm having with the Nexus 5 at this point. So if, my Nexus 5 is exactly as of this Thursday is a year old. What? Um, and it is starting to get to that point where I'm, I'm – part of it is I'm just running too much stuff in the background. You always I'm have been. Your, all, your Galaxy S3 was hysterical. I'm evil to phones. I'm hoping that I'm going to get enhanced um, control from – Android 5.0 on kind of when I can turn on. Sure. I don't have to have secondary battery apps. Um, I also need to go through and just like kill a bunch of apps, uninstall them, because they were all running services in the background that are running my phone battery down. But that's one of the problems I'm having with the Nexus 5, and most likely I will get to 18 months with the Nexus 5 before I just go. I can't. I can't do sure. this anymore. Yeah, yeah. And currently I'm on T-Mobile, and in all seriousness, I would, I would very much consider if Verizon didn't have such ridiculously expensive plans. I would very much consider going to Verizon well, for. I think I, I think if it really is this good a phone, they're going to get smart and offer it for the international market. Yeah, well, they're going to offer it in some form for the international market. Well, if it goes in the international market, there'll be an international unlocked, and you'll be fine. 
You just right. got to find the ones I, I, that has the right bands. Then I will pay $600. Oh, you just have to buy one from Spain. Right. Spain has the same bands we do. Right. And, you know, you're on, you're luckily, you're on Deutsche Telekom. I'm sorry, T-Mobile. So you're on a European company. So theoretically, there should at least be some hope of some crossover there. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. Well, T-Mobile is just crazy enough that they would do it. Right. So speaking of crazy enough to do it, um, we uh, don't generally, we sort of did with Zoe Quinn, but like we don't generally like delve too much in like the personal life uh, personal lives of the tech industry folks, right? Because, you know, mostly we're interested in the devices and what comes out of these people. But sometimes who they are becomes the story. Um, this week, uh, Tim Cook published an article in Bloom's Bloomberg Business Week about his sexual orientation. And I'll uh, read, his, uh, read his quote. Um, while I have never denied my sexuality, I haven't publicly acknowledged it either until now. So let me be clear. I'm, I'm proud to be gay, and I consider being gay among the greatest gifts God has given me. I'll jump down a little bit. I don't consider myself an activist, but I realize how much I've benefited from the sacrifice of others. So, if hearing that the CEO of Apple is gay can help someone struggling to come to terms with who he or she is, or bring comfort to anyone who feels alone, or inspire people to insist on their equality, then it's worth the trade-off with my own privacy. So Tim Cook, it has been, I wouldn't say an open secret, it's been kind of tacitly known in the Valley for a very long time that Tim Cook is gay. He consistently ends up as, you know, out magazine's most powerful gay man. I mean, like, people knew. But like he says in his article, he never really dealt with it. He, you know, says... um, Throughout my professional life, I've tried to main, maintain a basic level of privacy. Like, so we try to stay out of the fray. And I think living in the Valley and, and living in the tech industry, most people in the tech industry kind of look at this and go, big whoop, right? Because but, people are like, this is not new news. Right, this isn't new news and it's not a big deal. But outside of the tech bubble, this is a big deal. The head of the the titular head of the most valuable and art one of the if not the most valuable and one of the if not the most profitable corporations in the world is a gay man now if that doesn't look like some semblance of progress in this world i don't know what does right well and i think that it's more it's easier for you and i to see that being located you in Georgia mm-hmm. and in some cases in rural Georgia yep. and me in Houston, Texas. And also, um, I, you know, I, in my other life, I'm a Methodist pastor. And so I'm having a lot of these same kind of conversations about the role of LGBTQ folks um, in the life of the church as is being had in, you know, kind of writ large in the nation about the role of LGBTQ folks in the life of every other institution. Um, Silicon Valley being located in California is kind of past that. Um, right, sitting right, here right. in They're... the you know in the South, as you say, many folks are not past that. Um, and I think Tim Cook, in some ways, is really sticking his neck out there um, in being this public about something that, although may not be a big deal in the Valley, could be a big deal in some places here in the U.S. and a bigger deal in some places abroad. Where Tim Cook does business. Yeah, especially um, Africa. And Asia. I was going with and, China and um, specifically. Is that is that really an issue in China? I, I'm not I'm not familiar yes. with Chinese it, 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 social norms. Yes, it is. Um, it's a deal. And so this this is it may seem like a really easy step of activism to take thinking about the tech bubble, but outside of that I wouldn't call this radical, but this is a definite risk for the sake of others, right? Like, you know, he's right. He didn't have to do this. He can keep on being Apple's bloody CEO and, you know, doing a pretty darn good job at it and never have to say anything because he's not going to get questioned about it in his position. And, you know, he's doing a great job as a CEO of Apple. So who cares? But he chose to, to make the statement of standing up and try to stand in solidarity with people who don't have the benefits that he has. And we talk about in theological and, you know, 
academia circles about putting your privilege to good use. He has the privilege of being a white guy. He has the privilege of being in a place where it's not a big deal to be gay. And, and so he's the privilege of being the CEO, CEO of, of the it. most powerful company or one of the most valuable companies in the world. Right. And so he's been and he's been in a system that has allowed him to rise to that. I mean obviously he didn't get given it. He worked his tail off, r- creating one of the most efficient supply well, chains since that, the Roman Empire. <laughs> that has not, well, yeah, that has not discriminated. Well, since Walmart, um, right? That has not discriminated against him because of his sexual orientation, right? So, I think that and, that's the most important point of this. Right. And so he is in this privileged position, and rather than just being able to live comfortably in that, he's actually make giving himself putting himself in a deliberately uncomfortable situation of talking about his sex life in public which is always uncomfortable <laughs> Methodist pastor I have some understanding of this like eh, it's uncomfortable and he there is a very real element of risk um, for his business dealings not just in this country but abroad so I mean, there, you know there's not a whole lot of like analysis to be made here like Good job. Thank you, Tim. Good job. This is, this is literally a, we wanted to talk about it because we think that this is awesome. It's imp- And it's important. And it's important. It, it, it's not so much that important that he's gay. Like, congratulations. No, it, it's important that it's out there. This is like, you know, the cake. Congratulations on the sex. Like, great. Congratulations. <laughs> but that, it, that there- he made this statement and why he made this statement is what's important. It's the motivation. It's the to try and stand in solidarity with people who haven't had the advantages that he's had and try to create those advantages for more people. That this can just, again, be a no big whoop, right? You know, you and I went, okay, like, A, I already knew, because, like, I don't read Out Magazine, but, like, you know, periodically it comes across my news feeds. Um, and so... I have weird news feeds, okay? I'm not I'm not asking questions. I, I do don't, a right? podcast on progressive Christianity, and so because of my podcast on cr- progressive Christianity, weird things end up in my news feeds that would not fit necessarily into my tech news feeds. This is an interesting crossover where I will probably talk about this story on both shows. Um, Aren't you so glad that you have that? Uh, you can prep for both shows simultaneously. Yeah, I can. I mean, and I, this is twice now, because once I was talking about anonymous internet hate speech. That's true, actually. Uh, thanks, 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 Yik Yak. Oh God, Yik Yak. <laughs> There's so, nothing more glorious than Yik Yak on a nine-inch screen. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. God, you just can really grab the yaks. But and on that note, let's no, transition to even. this week's last call. <laughs> So Trey, have you ever wanted free internet? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Except when I got the Freedom Pop, it didn't work. <laughs> so I had free internet, and then I th- then I I stopped it. I threw it on the ground. I threw it on the ground. Yeah. So internet.org um, has has an app that is going to bring free Facebook, Wikipedia, BBC, and then local information to. All of Tanzania. Hey, I was once lived close to Tanzania. So, sort of. I mean, it's very similar to the way that Facebook's Internet Accessibility Initiative kind of in Zambia has been rolling out, where you get Facebook for free. Right. Because that's how you get Facebook when you don't have Internet. Right. So you, this is, by the way, how Facebook grows user base by not by right. getting the internet to people that don't have internet. Right, but this is one of those things where I go, yes, it's good for Facebook, who cares? Because they've yeah. bundled in enough things to make it useful outside of Facebook. And to a certain extent, ha- giving people access to Facebook allows them to organize in a way that they didn't have before. So there are actual, like, as a student of internet revolution, there are actual tangible uses for Facebook other than, you know, stalking about how your ex got fat. And it's also good for that. So well, the other, th- so here's the list of services that the internet.org app in Tanzania is going to offer. It'll have AccuWeather, okay. um, Baby Center and Mama, which yeah, are child care info yeah, services. Those are good. BBC News and BBC Swahili. Useful. Brighter Monday, jobs, which is a jobs board. Okay. Uh, the Citizen, which is Tanzanian English news. Okay, useful. Um, Facebook. Facts, uh, Facts for Life, which is the UNICEF, UNICEF, UNICEF there we go. Health app. Yep, that's a good one. 
Girl Effect, which is about young women's health and anti-poverty info. Messenger, obviously for Facebook. Um, two words I can't say because they're Tanzanian. Um, they're probably Kiswahili. They're I'll Swahili. Look up, okay. I'll look up the story. You keep reading. Wanaki. You keep reading. Wan- I'll, let, let, me look, let me look at it. OLX, which is classified. Shul Direct, which is online education. Um, Super Sport, which is sports, Tanzania Today, local news, and then Wikipedia, of course. Mawanachi. Mawanachi? Yeah, close enough. Yeah, Mawanachi and Mawanaspati. Yeah. Mawanaspati. Mawanachi and Mawanaspati. Mawana. Gosh, so hard. Words. Words are hard. Kiswahili's rough, man. Like, yeah, those sounds are. My mouth is not designed to make those sounds. I have to think. I have to, like. Think about how my Kenyan friends talked, and then translate that into words. It's almost as bad as Gallego. Yeah, not no, quite, but almost. Well, Gallego is deceptive for me because it's like that it sounds sh- close to Spanish, but it's, but it's not, not Spanish. Spanish. It's like that's like that's kind of. I don't know Kiswahili. I just yeah, Moana. Yeah, Moana, Moana, Moana Chi, and Moana Spati. So those are useful. Sorry, I'm not a rabbit hole. Those are useful apps. That's enough. That sure, it's a shill for Facebook. Absolutely, it's a shill for Facebook. I get that. But they actually get things like health information and things that can help with farming and news and a tool, Facebook, that can help you overthrow a repressive regime. So, in some ways, everybody wins. I don't subscribe to the idea behind corporate charity that it can't benefit the corporation because well, any corporate charity is an attempt at free – is it a, another way of advertising. And that's great because you want to know what gets funded? Real work. Well, and this is also our position on um, restaurant weeks mm-hmm. at, at various – in various deal. cities. Specifically, this was at Houston Restaurant Weeks where the restaurant gets to have their name on a list – of like, oh look, we will do this thing. They get to make money. Sure. However, then the Houston Food Bank, which is one of the only food banks in the country that actually works without having government like help it. Yeah, it's not a USDA. So let's look at you know same thing with the uh, um, ice bucket challenge and ALS. They saw donations go through the roof. So who cares that celebrities were using it for self endorsement? Great. You know what happened? A lot of money got raised for disease no one was thinking about. Or um, the product red stuff. So the iPad that powers the show has a, po- a product red case. Now yeah, I get that. I pr- couldn't see it. Wait, I'll just rip off the case. I'm on a different. So here's the my product red case. And every Apple's one of the product red things. And Converse used to be as well. And so anytime I have the chance to buy a product red product, I do. Now I get, like, oh, it's just advertising, and not that much money goes to charity. Right. But that has led to Global Fund, which I happen to know does a lot of great work in public health. That and Bill and Melinda Gates, um, which is in some ways just a shill for Microsoft, right? Um, No, 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 no. It's so that Bill and Melinda Gates can feel good about all of the dirty, dirty money that they got from Microsoft. Who cares? Who cares? Major diseases are being combated with these huge – like, it takes these kind of things to get – millions and hundreds of millions of dollars available for charity and so if this leads to millions of more people having access to what is a pretty good basic basic slate of services i don't care if facebook benefits because sometimes everyone can win and on that note it's time to end look we have a positive show title sometimes everyone can win you want to know what Except for MCX, we liked everything else on this show. This was an overwhelmingly positive show, and you should all be very thankful for that. Sometimes everyone can win. <laughs> I mean, that's true. I hate I hate M- MCX and current C, but I'm happy about Tim Cook being happy. <laughs> I am happy about free I internet. Think that, and, I think that should be the show I'm happy title. about Tim Cook being happy. Oh, great. <laughs> I am happy about Tim Cook being happy. I'm happy about Tim Cook being happy and gay. Um, I like the Microsoft Band. We're excited about the Droid Turbo. 
this is a really positive show. So if you have other positive things that you'd like to share with us, podcast at textlastcall.com, facebook.com slash textlastcall, pinterest.com slash textlastcall, or at textlastcall on the Twitters. However you find us, we'll be seeing you on the interwebs. Almost made out of sound saying something tremendously dumb. Almost. Almost. So close. So close.